As I review the events of my past life, I realize how subtle are the influences that shape our destinies. An incident of my youth may serve to illustrate. One winter's day, I managed to climb a steep mountain in company with other boys. The snow was quite deep and a warm southerly wind made it just suitable for the purpose. We amused ourselves by throwing balls which would roll down a certain distance, gathering more or less snow, and we tried to outdo one another in this exciting sport. Suddenly, a ball was seen to go beyond the limit, swelling to enormous proportions until it became as big as a house and plunged, thundering into the valley below with a force that made the ground tremble. I looked on, spellbound, incapable of understanding what had happened. For weeks afterward, the picture of the avalanche was before my eyes, and I wondered how anything so small could grow to such an immense size. Ever since that time, the magnification of feeble actions fascinated me. And when, years later, I took up the experimental study of mechanical and electrical resonance, I was keenly interested from the very start. Possibly, had it not been for that early powerful impression, I might not have followed up the little spark I obtained with my coil and never developed my best invention. I was offered a position in Paris, which I gladly accepted. I can never forget the deep impression that magic city produced on my mind. For several days after my arrival, I roamed through the streets in utter bewilderment of the new spectacle. The attractions were many and irresistible. I had a rather strenuous life in what would now be termed Rooseveltian fashion. Every morning, regardless of weather, I would go from the Boulevard Saint-Marcel, where I resided, to a bathing house on the Seine, plunge into the water, loop the circuit 27 times, and then walk an hour to reach Ivry, where the company's factory was located. There I would have a woodchopper's breakfast at half past seven o'clock, and then eagerly await the lunch hour, in the meanwhile cracking hard nuts for the manager of the works, Mr. Charles Batchelor, who was an intimate friend and assistant of Edison. Here I was thrown in contact with a few Americans, who fairly fell in love with me because of my proficiency in billiards. The utter failure of my attempts to raise capital for development was another disappointment, and when Mr. Batchelor pressed me to go to America with a view of redesigning the Edison machines, I was determined to try my fortunes in the land of golden promise. This video is sponsored by Private Internet Access, a great value, reliable VPN service. Here at Voices of the Past, a lot of our videos explore international perspectives and incredible journeys to far off lands to try and understand how foreign cultures live and think. And that is what a VPN can do when it comes to Netflix and all your favorite streaming services. If Nikola Tesla had used Private Internet Access, he would have had no trouble accessing all the geo-restricted content from back home in Serbia. Indeed, I'm based in Spain, and private internet access has meant that I can even access Japanese television. Because it may come as a surprise to you guys, but I like Japan. On top of this, the encryption services and 20,000 servers in 70 countries makes private internet access a great choice when going online safely. So, click on the link in the description to get complete digital privacy for less than $3 a month and three extra months for free. Thanks for your time, and back to the journey. I liquefied my modest assets, secured accommodations, and found myself at the railroad station as the train was pulling out. At that moment, I discovered that my money and tickets were gone. What to do was the question. Hercules had plenty of time to deliberate, but I had to decide while running alongside the train, with opposite feelings surging in my brain like condenser oscillations. Resolve, helped by dexterity, won out in the nick of time and upon passing through the usual experiences, I managed to embark for New York with the remnants of my belongings, some poems and articles I had written, and a packet of calculations related to solutions of an unsolvable integral, and to my flying machine. I wish that I could put in words my first impression of this country, in the Arabian tales, I read how genii transported people into a land of dreams to live through delightful adventures. My case was just the reverse. 
the genii had carried me from a world of dreams into one of realities. What I had left was beautiful, artistic and fascinating in every way. What I saw here was machined, rough and unattractive. A burly policeman was twirling his stick which looked to me as big as a log. I approached him politely with the request to direct me. Six blocks down, then to the left, he said, with murder in his eyes. Is this America? I asked myself in painful surprise. It is a century behind Europe in civilization. And yet, when I went abroad in 1889, five years having elapsed since my arrival here, I became convinced that it was more than 100 years ahead of Europe, and nothing has happened to this day to change my opinion. The meeting with Edison was a memorable event in my life. I was amazed at this wonderful man who, without early advantages in scientific training, had accomplished so much. I had studied a dozen languages, delved in literature and art, and had spent my best years in libraries, reading all sorts of stuff that fell into my hands, from Newton's Principia to the novels of Paul de Kock, and felt that most of my life had been squandered. But it did not take long before I recognised that it was the best thing I could have done. Within a few weeks, I had won Edison's confidence, and it came about in this way. The SS Oregon, the fastest passenger steamer at that time, had both of its lighting machines disabled and its sailing was delayed. As the superstructure had been built after their installation, it was impossible to remove them from the hold. The predicament was a serious one, and Edison was much annoyed. In the evening, I took the necessary instruments with me and went aboard the vessel where I stayed for the night. The dynamos were in bad condition, having several short circuits and breaks, but with the assistance of the crew I succeeded in putting them in good shape. At five o'clock in the morning, when passing along Fifth Avenue on my way to the shop, I met Edison with Bachelor and a few others as they were returning home to retire. Here is our Parisian, running around at night, he said. When I told him that I was coming from the Oregon and had repaired both machines, he looked at me in silence and walked away without another word. But when he had gone some distance, I heard him remark, Bachelor, this is a damn good man. And from that time on, I had full freedom in directing the work. For nearly a year, my regular hours were from 10.30am until 5 o'clock the next morning, without a day's exception. Edison said to me, I have had many hard-working assistants, but you take the cake. During this period, I designed 24 different types of standard machines with short cores and of uniform pattern which replaced the old ones. The manager had promised me $50,000 on the completion of this task, but it turned out to be a practical joke. This gave me a painful shock, and I resigned my position. Immediately thereafter, some people approached me with the proposal of forming an arc light company under my name, to which I agreed. Here, finally, was an opportunity to develop the motor. But when I broached the subject to my new associates, they said, No, we want the arc lamp. We don't care for this alternating current of yours. In 1886, my system of arc lighting was perfected and adopted for factory and municipal lighting, and I was free, but with no other possession than a beautifully engraved certificate of stock of hypothetical value. Then followed a period of struggle in the new medium for which I was not fitted, but the reward came in the end, and in April 1887, the Tesla Electric Company was organised, providing a laboratory and facilities. The motors I built there were exactly as I had imagined them. I made no attempt to improve the design, but merely reproduced the pictures as they appeared to my vision, and the operation was always as I expected. In the early part of 1888, an arrangement was made with the Westinghouse Company for the manufacture of the motors on a large scale. But great difficulties still had to be overcome. They did not want to depart from their standard forms of apparatus, and my efforts had to be concentrated upon adapting the motor to these conditions. Another necessity was to produce a motor capable of running efficiently at this frequency on two wires, which was not easy to accomplish. At the close of 1889, however, my services in Pittsburgh being no longer essential, I returned to New York, 
and resumed experimental work in a laboratory on Grand Street, where I began immediately the design of high-frequency machines. The problems of construction in this unexplored field were novel and quite peculiar, and I encountered many difficulties. Despite this, my progress was so rapid as to enable me to exhibit at my lectures in 1891 a coil giving sparks of five inches. Since my early announcement of the invention, it has come into universal use and wrought a revolution in many departments. But a still greater future awaits it. When in 1900 I obtained powerful discharges of a hundred feet and flashed a current around the globe, I was reminded of the first tiny spark I observed in my Grand Street laboratory and was thrilled by sensations akin to those I felt when I discovered the rotating magnetic field. In one of these biographical sketches, I have dwelt on the circumstances of my early life and told of an affliction which compelled me to unremitting exercise of imagination and self-observation. This mental activity, at first involuntary under the pressure of illness and suffering, gradually became second nature and led me finally to realise that I was but an automaton, devoid of free will in thought and action and merely responsive to the forces of the environment. Our bodies are of such complexity of structure, the motions we perform are so numerous and involved, and the external impressions on our sense organs to such a degree delicate and elusive, that it is hard for the average person to grasp this fact. We are automata, entirely controlled by the forces of the medium being tossed about like corks on the surface of the water, but mistaking the resultant of the impulses from the outside for free will. The movements and other actions we perform are always life-preservative, and though seemingly quite independent from one another, we are connected by invisible links. A very sensitive and observant being, with his highly developed mechanism all intact, and acting with precision in obedience to the changing conditions of the environment, is endowed with a transcending mechanical sense, enabling him to evade perils too subtle to be directly perceived.